blessing one another as children, as grandchildren. Grandma Gladys shared last week, and if you had an opportunity to hear her message, she did a great job. And if you remember the story of shotgun toting grandma, that was her. Some of you were here last week for that. And she shared some wisdom about how it is that we can both parent our adult children as well as our grandkids. We're going to be talking today about finances. And if you turn to your center program, um, there's a section in there that you can fill out as we go through this together. And we're talking about finances because ultimately many families get into difficulties, um, whether they have children or don't have children, because of this area of finances. We discussed this briefly last year when we did a sermon series on marriage relationships. And we talked about that sense that um, eight out of ten marriages dissolve in some way, shape, or form over finances because of the stress or the pressure. And that finances really mean and discuss really values. Do we have any parents of teenagers here today, by chance? We have one parent. Kay, could you do me a favor? Do you have your, your purse with you, by chance? Could you pull out, do you have any pictures of your kids, like Mitch? Do you really? Can you just hold that up? I, I have found that, in principle, most parents, if you ask them if they have a picture of their teenager, they will have a picture of their teenager. Now, if you ask that same teen parent if they have a 20 or a $50 bill, they'll say, no. Isn't that amazing that somehow they traded in that $20 bill for a picture of their teenager? <laughs> See, I'm very, I, knew, I knew that you'd be a loving, caring mom and that you'd have your picture with you. And that is true that many times once children arrive, it seems like the spare cash we used to have in our billfolds disappear. And what we find instead are pictures of our teenagers in replacing where the money used to be. And there's some reason for that, isn't there? It's because somehow when families come, there's a change in our finances. And what I'll be talking today is about family finance, but really these are general principles of finances. Whether you have children, whether you don't have children, these are biblical principles of what God says about stewardship. This passage we read is not a stewardship passage, by the way. This was one of the passages I was reading. If you turn to Matthew 25 in your Bibles, and it talks about the parable of the ten virgins. I was actually reading the parable of the talents, which is one that is um, in Matthew 25:14. And the parable of the talents talks about money that was given or, or stewardship of time that's given. In, and I wrote down in my Bible that I preached on this four years ago. And I told our congregation that I will not continue to preach on God's word until I've preached through all of God's word. And so I looked, I said, boy, I really want to preach on Matthew 25, 14, really bad. But I can't because I've already taught on that one. So I, I, I went up the passage to Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And I began to realize as I studied the two in context together that they're interrelated. As all of God's word, it connects one to the other. But particularly here, where the parable of the ten virgins is related to stewardship. Now this passage, when it's usually preached and talked about, it's talking about the end times. In fact, all of Matthew 24 primarily talks about to be prepared and to watch because we don't know the day or the hour. We're not sure when Christ will come back. And I would agree that that is very true. That the overall context of this passage of the parable of the ten virgins is about being prepared for God's second coming. But when you link it with the passage below and the following passage on the sheep and the goats, it talks about not only being prepared spiritually for Christ's return, but being prepared as well in terms of our stewardship of our time and our talents. Let's look at God's word this morning together as we, we look at this. First of all, we say in... Um, um, the first point I want to make out this morning has to talk about to be wise in stewardship. I'm kind of going to talk about the parable of the, of the, of the um, wise and foolish lamp holders, if you will. And we notice that some had a wise pattern, some had a foolish pattern. And I want you to be wise today. So we want to first of all talk about being wise in stewardship. What does that term stewardship mean? Now, Ryan, I know you studied this in Bible college because you're a good crown graduate. What would be your definition of stewardship as they taught you in college? Excellent. Because it's a word we don't use very much anymore, is it? A steward was the manager of a household. And so when someone was considered a steward, it was they ran everything in the house, but they didn't own it. Usually there was a property owner, and sometimes that property owner would be uh, there while he was stewarding or she was stewarding the house. Other times they may be vacant and they'd be gone. And so there's that sense of when we are called to be stewards, God is the owner, if you will. God owns everything. And I'm basically his money manager. And once you kind of get that perspective is that God is the owner, 
and that we're the money manager, there's a sense of thinking differently. I know we're training my daughter on PowerPoint this morning. Is she up there somewhere? Oh, there you are. I was just wondering if it was going to be on the screen this morning. No? Okay. Never mind. I don't think anybody's up there. Okay. Oh, they're there. They're waving. All right. Never mind. We're on 1A, whoever's up there. Okay. There we go. There we go. God owns everything, and I'm his money manager. One of the examples of this is uh, John Wesley. John Wesley is the founder of kind of the Methodist movement. And he was a great person that understood this concept of money management. One of the things he did is he made a goal as a young man that every year he would give one more percentage of his income to um, the church. So one of the things he did is when he was like, like 22 years old, he was beginning to give 20%. When he was 23, he gave 23%. He lived to the age of 87, and he ended up giving 90% of his income away. He gave up tea and coffee and things like that as he got older because he said, you know what? I don't need those things anymore, and God does. From the journals he wrote, the books he wrote, he talked about every year trying to increase his giving and living on less. It, he was on one of his um, spiritual revivals where he went down to London and, and was preaching in tent meetings and so forth. And while he was gone, his house started on fire. And all of his possessions were burned to the ground. And when he came back, you know, the pastors that were there from that town, you know, came to break the news to him. And they realized that he would be just, you know, terribly, terribly depressed because he had this huge library of books and he had so many of his resources for his ministry were in his home. And this is a quote when they got back to talk to him about him, about this. They said, you know, John, we're so sorry, but your house has burned down. And John turned and responded this way, my house has burned down. You must be mistaken. No, the Lord's house burned down. That just means one less responsibility for me. He looked at the fact that he never owned that house anyway. God was the man, owner of the house. He was just managing it. And if God decided to take away the home, that was one less thing for him to manage. One less thing for him to deal with. And that was his perspective on stewardship. It was that sense of management. I had a, a retreat I went to, I mentioned, where I got to meet Chuck Norris, which I was very excited about in meeting Chuck Norris a couple weeks ago. And that was such a, a blessing to me. And at this retreat down in Dallas, there was a guy there. They did a skit that was very hilarious. They had a skit where they came in, and this guy gave somebody a, a FedEx package. And he signed for the little thing, and the FedEx guy took, and he walked about 10 feet down here. All of a sudden, he rips open the package. <laughs> and, and the speaker's like, you know, kind of looking at him. And he pulled the stuff out, and he had some money and some bills and some, like, paperwork, and he takes, and he stuffs in his pocket and then walks away. And then later on in the, in the seminar, there was another speaker. He got the FedEx guy, and the FedEx guy comes up, and he signs for something. He walks in. And same thing. The FedEx guy kind of rips open the package, looks inside, sees what's in it, throws some stuff on the ground, takes the stuff he wants, sticks it in his pocket, and walks away. This happened four times. And finally, the fourth speaker, go, go, he says, I'm not giving you a package. And the, guy, the FedEx guy goes, well, why? He goes, well, I've noticed that every time you come up here on stage, they give you a package with some money and some things in it. You keep what you want, and then you just dump the rest on the ground. He goes, I'm not giving you a package. And the guy says, well, I'm the FedEx guy. When I come, you're supposed to give me something, then I take it away. And the guy says, yeah, I give it to you because you're supposed to then take in return and give it to someone else. You're a steward of my package. You're not to keep the package. Don't you get that? Didn't they train you at FedEx that when you get a package, you're only supposed to hold it long enough to deliver it to where it's supposed to go? And all of a sudden, everybody in the audience goes, ah. And the FedEx guy's got all these excuses. But I wanted to see what was in the package, and I thought some of that stuff in the package was for me, and, you know, I could use the stuff in the package more than whoever you were sending it to. And he had all these excuses about why he wanted to keep everything in the package. And the guy said, but don't you understand? If you don't deliver the things in the package the way intended, I'm not going to give you any more things to deliver. If you are not a good money manager or a good steward, God will not bless you in that way. If you look at the parable of the talents, Matthew 25 here, you knew I was going to sneak it in there sometime, didn't you? You know, I couldn't just like, even though I preached on it before, Matthew 25, if you look at that passage, there's a synopsis there very much of just that. In the parable of talents, he said he gave some five talents. And some um, uh, uh, five talents, then we have, he um, entrusted some with just one talent. And then some with two talents. 
and each of them came back. And at the end, he gave more to those that had used their talents wisely. And in that same way with our FedEx guy, we know the same thing. If we give somebody a package and they deliver it well, we're more likely to use that company again. God in that same way thinks about us. Are you a good money manager? Are you wise in the things of God? Well, the questions, if we turn to um, Psalm 24. The psalmist has uh, the same way to look at it. David was talking about this in Psalm 24, about God's blessings in our life. We're familiar with Psalm 23, aren't we? It's just one more past that. 24 one says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded upon the seas and he established it upon the waters. In other words, if we remember that everything in the world is God's, we just pass through. We're just here for a short period of time. And as a steward, and as Ryan defines steward as that, that person who's responsible for watching over the other things, then we are the managers. And God allows us that opportunity as we, as we see fit, as long as we're faithful to him. One of the ways that we can be a good steward is to kind of follow that giving model. That giving model. Look in, if you will, to Luke uh, 21. We have a, a passage here of Jesus, and he's pointing out to the, his disciples that whole sense of what does it mean to give. And they're, they're discussing, you know, what does it mean to be a good steward, and the Pharisees were there giving money and so forth and making a big show of it and trying to promote the fact that they were giving money. And all of a sudden there's this older woman who gives money, the widow's offering, he calls it. Luke 21.1, As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury, he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. He says, I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty all that she had to live on. Jesus was pointing out the fact that it's an attitude of the heart. It's not the amount you give. You give proportionally in terms of what God has blessed you with, and you give out of the heart because you love God. And what he was pointing out here was the obvious, is that these Pharisees were not in a giving attitude. They didn't have the right spirit. And so when they were putting their money in the, the copper kettles, they were shaking it or making the noise. They, they were showing it in a processional way. That's what I love when we pass the plates is we try to keep it so you can put your money in an envelope. You can um, fill out an attendance slip and just put that in there. Many of you give electronically. And so you, you don't even have to put money in the plate, and that's a blessing as well. However you give, it's that sense of we want you to be able to give without having to have a show. You don't have to walk up and put it on the altar here. And it's that giving family model. One of the ways um, we think about this is that sometimes we can struggle with giving. In fact, lots of pastors like myself struggle with even giving those stewardship kind of sermons or finance kind of sermons. And I think we do because we don't always correlate how it is that through giving we grow in our faith. C. One of the ways we do giving is we give of our first fruits. Now, this is a, a principle that God really laid in my heart. Um, I looked at my stewardship sermon of a couple years ago, and I had a sermon that was similar to this. It talked about, um, about setting a budget, and it talked about um, establishing a good savings program. And then I noticed that my final point was about sharing back with what God has given you. And I realized today I need to just flip-flop that around. When I did this a couple years ago, I should have started with what God started with, which is first fruits. The first act of your budget or the first act of your thinking of giving should come from what does God want from you? Let's look in God's word again. Leviticus chapter 2, 14. If you present a grain offering to the Lord from your first portion of your harvest, bring kernels of new grain that you have roasted on a fire. In other words, what he's saying here is that they were just teaching the um, early believers of Moses what it's like to, to share. They were setting up tabernacle worship and they were just received the Ten Commandments and they were trying to discuss what is it like to worship God. And he was giving them certain rules and rituals to perform. And one of those rules or rituals was to bring their first portion to the tabernacle and to do that as a sacrifice. Remember, they had learned about sacrifice the wrong way. Remember, they took the gold and they tried to build a, 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 a calf and they tried to worship that calf and do sacrifices. And God said, no, no, no. I don't want any graven images. But I still want you to bring something that, that shows that I am your God. 
and I want your first fruits, your finest, if you will. He restates this again in Leviticus 23. He says, when you arrive in the land I'm giving you, you'll be harvesting your first crops. Bring the priest some grain from the first portion of your grain harvest. This is the part that's sometimes confusing for people, is that there's a, a sense of what they gave for sacrifice, and there was a sense of they gave other grains or meats or resources for the running of the tabernacle or the running of the church. In that same way, we um, bring a portion of those first fruits for the running of God's ministry and God's work. And that's the biblical principle whereby we do that. Josh, are you here for a second? Can you bring me a napkin? Did you bring me a napkin here today? I was out last weekend, um, very blessed with my family to go out and go apple picking. This is a fine, juicy Regent apple, by the way, for those of you who know your different apple styles. And then, uh, the Regent apple was actually developed by the University of Minnesota as one of the fine northern apple um, produces that have been developed and are very crisp, very sweet, um, has a little bit of a tart taste to it. And um, our sister church, Little Prairie, is actually going to be hosting an apple picking time today. So if you'd like to join us after church, we're going to go down there, and the owner of the apple orchard from Nelson Farms, who's a member of Little Prairie United Methodist Church, has offered to give as many apples as we can pick to the poor today. We can take boxes out there, and we can take them to the food shelf afterwards. So I was just warming up with my family last weekend, picking apples. Now, does this look tasty to you, Kate? Are you an apple eater? Would you like to take a bite? Oh, your braces. Who would like to take a bite? Lauren, can you take a bite? You tell me if this is delicious as it looks. That's a good apple. Now, if I were to walk over to you, Glenn, would you like to take a bite if I flip it around like this? Why don't you try a bite of that apple? Now, Lauren wasn't set up. Was that, was that a good apple or is that a good apple? That's a good apple. Now, how many more people do you think would like to take a bite out of this apple? Not as many are as tempted after you see two big bites of it, are you? Josh, do you want to take a bite? There's one little spot maybe left there, right? Mm, is that a good apple? That's a good apple. Now who wants to take a bite out of this apple? Any takers? Oh, oh we got one in the back. All right. <laughs> you think you can find a spot in there to bite, Mitch? Come here. There you go. There you go. Anybody else like to take a bite out of the apple now? <laughs> oh, you already had one, Josh. That's okay. The point is that every time we take a bite out, this fruit doesn't look quite as good, does it? And many times what we're doing in our giving is that same way. We think about God as kind of the, the leftovers. And so we say, well, here's a, a bite out of what God has given me because I have to pay my housing bill and I have to pay my electrical bill and I have to pay my mortgage and I have to um, you know, get groceries. And every time we take a bite, we take a bite, we take a bite and we go, well, I got to do this and I got to do that and I have my savings account and, and pretty soon, all that's left is the core. And that's what we give God. Not our first fruits, not the first bite, which he asked for, but we give him kind of that, that slimy leftovers, the core. And so many times we forget that that isn't what God asked for. He said, give me your, your finest. Give me your first fruits. And if you do that, I will bless you. He says in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, he goes, test me in this, and I will bless you. And what he wants to do is understand that if we are willing to sacrifice our first fruits, that he is willing to bless us with many more fruits so that we will never run out, so that we will never go hungry, and that we will always feel a sense of blessing. So C is give your first fruits. And D is just kind of a statistic. When I went to the same seminar, it said this statistic. It says the average non-Catholic, they had different statistics for different denominations and so forth, give about 2.6% of their income to the church about 2.6 percent. And they said that that's just pretty standard among most churches. Some may be a hair higher, some may be a hair lower. And I think that probably what they were trying to challenge us as pastors about is how do we remind people about giving in such a way as not to guilt them. God loves a cheerful giver. But in a way that challenges them to understand that we are to, to give of the tithe. That we, and that tithe simply means 10 percent or more. One guy talked about the tithe when we were out there. He um, had a little skit where he did a guy on training wheels. And he talked about how the tithe is the training wheels that God gives us so eventually we can take those wheels off and that we can bicycle free. And that there's that sense of training us about our faith 
by having that tithe as the training wheels. Um, Hudson Taylor stated it this way, the less I spent on myself and gave to others, the fuller of happiness and blessing my soul became. So we know that giving of our first fruits is one of the things of a, of a healthy, balanced understanding of finances. Number two is we need to be wise in our savings. God said that he does not want us to go through as paupers through life just because we're giving back to God. In fact, the opposite is he begins to bless us through our first fruit offerings. He wants us to be able to save and to be prepared. In fact, if you look at this parable that we're just um, reading about the lamps, that was the key part of the parable was that they were to save of the oil and they were to be prepared when he came. Let's look at this, Matthew 25, 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. In other words, they weren't prepared. The wise, however, took the oil in jars along with their lamps. They had saved up. The bridegroom came along and coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. The first thing I think that God would like us to do in saving is be prepared for the unexpected. Be prepared for the unexpected. We met with a financial planner, Deb and I did, kind of to discuss some things in our own personal family finances. We also knew we were doing this sermon series and we're doing a finance seminar tonight. And he said one of the first things that, that families forget to do is to have an account set up if one of you were to get sick or ill or have um, a problem where you couldn't make some payments for a month or two because of a loss of jobs, whatever it is, he said that that is one of the first things that you need to kind of think about is what would you do if one of you became disabled or one of you lost a job? He said even if you're disabled, it takes a couple months for the insurance to kick in and for the, the bills to get paid. He says many people don't think about that. They don't prepare for the unexpected. And that got me thinking about that as well, is that these foolish brides and wise brides, some of them were prepared, some of them were not. Let's look at another passage here. 25.6, as you keep going, it says, At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. In other words, they started them up again. They lit them, just like Josh did when he lit our candles. We have oil candles here. They did that same thing. And he said, The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And I have a hard time with this passage because I think that's very non-sharing. You know what I mean? I sat there go, I don't like this passage. I think they should have said, well, here's half our oil. Uh, why don't you come with us? But God's word doesn't say that. God's word says that he blessed those that were prepared and ready. Indebtedness, I think, sometimes is one of those ways where we're not ready to receive the blessing that God has for us. In other words, indebtedness is one of those things that can kill savings. It's a sense of we're, we're not um, thinking about how it is that we can be good money managers or stewards. And when we're indebted, we're taking basically the owner's stuff and selling it. It's almost if you think about it this way. Um, if the owner owns the house and he's gone for a while, all of a sudden we say, you know what, let's have a garage sale. <laughs> and you know what, let's not just get rid of the junk. Well, maybe we'll get rid of his nice, you know, um, couch. Or, boy, there's a big screen TV. Let's put that in the garage sale as well. And pretty soon, when the manager comes back and says, you know, my living room looks a little empty. What happened? It's because you sold things that weren't yours. And someday there will be an account. And there's that sense of when we're in debt that we get behind. And at that point, it's hard sometimes to catch up. Proverbs 22, 26 says this way. Do not be a, a man who strikes hands in pledge or puts up securities for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. I think I don't have to go along discussion on indebtedness. I think that as a culture, we understand that. When I talked to my financial planner, he said that the average person that he was meeting with, and this is in the Apple Valley, Lakeville area, he said it's usually a two-income family, but sometimes it's an income with one primary giver and another person part-time. He said the average person that he meets with has between seventeen dollars and $20,000 credit card debt. The majority of those persons are paying at an average of either 15 to 20%. Now figure that out. 
I'm not a real huge math scholar here, but let me see if I can figure this out. If they had $20,000 at 15%, how much interest would that be in a year? That's right. Jim's the math scholar here. You got it real quick, didn't you? $3,000. So if a person is in debt $20,000 to paying it on their credit card, they're paying just an interest, not any principal, $3,000 a year. That's a lot of money. And you can see how over time that can begin to erode any ability to save or to give generously because it goes to paying interest. And he was talking about how he had just met with somebody that had over 70000 And he was trying to come up with a plan for them to buy that down and they were looking at bankruptcy. And he was just begging and pleading with them to say, you know, you can do this. They made over 150000 a year. It's looking at how can you reduce your spending in such a way is to pay off that indebtedness. My question for you this morning is, are you wise in your savings? And are you prepared for the unexpected? Number three, be wise in your spending. One of the ways that you can really be a good steward is to set up a budget for your resource options. Look at how is it you give, how is it you save, and how is it you spend. And live simply so others can simply live. I love that phrase that John Wesley used. He challenged each of his pastors to live simply so others can simply live. Look in the book of Hebrews this morning, if you have your Bible. It's in the New Testament, kind of towards the end there. Hebrews chapter 13. There's two verses that remind us of this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I am not afraid. What can man do for me? There's a story about a uh, St. Olaf alumni, and they were gathered around um, this professor, and they were having conversations kind of about um, th- what it was like to be an alumni and to get started in life. And this professor was a mentor to many of them. And so they were kind of complaining about some of their stresses. They are complaining about what it's like to get into the career world. And he had them all over for um, tea and coffee. And so he set before them an assortment of cups, some really beautiful china, some porcelain ones, then some kind of under everyday kind of glasses and, and cups. And then he actually had some styrofoam ones out there. And he set them all out there. And he had his coffee and his tea and various things. And then he sat down. And he was the last one to, to get a container. And so each of them went and they, they picked up their cups and they kind of looked around and they poured their tea or their coffee and then they sat down with their snack and their, and their beverage. And then he was the last one to go up. And when he went up there, he took the styrofoam cup that was left, he poured his coffee into it and he went and he sat down. And when he was with these persons, they were kind of talking about the stresses of life. And as he said, that's why he came to get them there to pray for them and to encourage them. And then he said something to them. He said, if you noticed, all the nice looking cups were taken up first. Did you guys notice that? And that you left behind some of the cheap looking ones or the styrofoam ones or there was a couple chipped ones there. And he said, I know that it's normal for you to want the best for yourselves. I mean, you went to a fine school like St. Olaf and you were well educated. But did you ever think about why you picked up those cups? I noticed when some of you walked in, you were kind of looking around to see which cups would be taken first. And one of you took a china cup, the rest of you followed suit. And I noticed that when you sat down, you kind of looked around to see who had what kind of cup. And then you noticed that I grabbed a styrofoam cup, and many of you started to look down at your cups. You never even noticed before that you had china cups till I was holding my styrofoam cup. And then some of you began to kind of shift in your seats a little bit. Because you know me, and you knew that you were going to get a lesson soon. <laughs> and he said, this is your lesson. He said, life is the coffee, or life is the tea. Life is that stuff. And so many times we're so concerned about the cup, our money, our possessions, our house, our car. And we forget the importance is the stuff, the coffee. It's the beverage. And we get so concerned about the containers of our life that so many times we miss life itself. I think of that phrase of John Wesley, living simply so others can simply live, is that it doesn't matter the containers we drive, the containers we live in, the containers even where we go to work. What matters is your relationship with God and is your life grounded and centered in Him. The last point this morning, well, there's one quote I just want to throw there for you. Is C is, the happiest people don't have the best of everything. They just make the best of everything. 
Number four, be wise in serving. Serving as a, really a lifestyle. First Timothy, Paul was writing to him and reminding them what it really means to be a life of service. He says this, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of that life that is truly life. He was, in fact, kind of quoting Jesus because Jesus told his disciples to lay up treasures in heaven. And Paul was reminding Timothy of this principle of really paying forward, if you were, paying ahead, setting up your ERA, your eternal retirement plan, and saying that's the most important thing you can do. He says this in 1 Peter 5, 2, As a fellow elder, this is my appeal to you. Care for the flock of God entrusted to you, Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you'll get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your good example. And when the head shepherd comes, your reward will be never-ending. And it will be a never-ending share in his glory and honor. How does God say to you how to become rich? He gives us the answer right there. We become rich through our giving and through our serving. And he wants to bless us. He wants to be that shepherd that comes back and says, well done, good and faithful steward. Thank you for managing what I've given you well. Are you wise or foolish in your serving? God wants you to be wise. You see, God sees our faith and our finances as inseparable, interconnected. And God wants you to be wise this day that when you leave, you can say that I am a good and faithful servant, that I am a steward or a manager of what God has given me, and I am showing wisdom in that stewardship. Let us pray. Faithful and loving God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word, which speaks so clearly about how it is that we need to be wise in our giving, how it is that we need to be wise in our savings, how it is that we need to be wise in setting up a budget, and how it is that we need to be wise in serving and giving back. Lord, I just pray this morning that you would give us your wisdom, that through the discernment of your spirit, you would show us the direction that we should go this day. I pray for these things in your name.